appreciate you all coming this morning. Um, we have a cool panel. I think, you know, as AWE enters its tenure, we've come up with some ideas about how augmented reality works, how the startups work, and how the startups get funded, and how they succeed is still a little uh, up for grabs, so to speak. Um, I think, you know, an uh, interesting way to start off the panel, uh, you know, this is kind of fascinating because the, the founders at Brex, the kind of startups credit card company, they, it was announced that they had, you know, raised a, a $2 billion, raised at a $2 billion valuation. Brex, the founders started off as VR founders and they had to pivot to uh, making money. <laughs> so, you know. It's the most valuable VR company. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they're, they're, they're right up there with Oculus. So, you know, when you think about uh, entrepreneurs who have this big fire burning in them who, you know, want to start something, in, in 2019, can you really recommend becoming a startup founder in the AR space, or are there just too many unknowns right now? Uh, for me, uh, I think you need to be careful. Um, there's, there's definitely opportunities in the market and you know, being a founder in this space can, can work pretty well. Um, but there isn't just like an AR market. You've got to pick the right piece of the AR market that's working today. Um, you've also got to be sort of buy-in, you know, just personally be comfortable that it probably isn't going to be some you know, 18 month boom or bust type of opportunity, but it's something that there is like the, one of these fundamental transitions happening in the industry that's going to play out over a decade, and that you know some new company uh, that's doing AR stuff is probably going to be worth similar to what Facebook and Google and Microsoft are worth today. That tends to happen every time one of these shifts. So if that sort of long-term opportunity is exciting and you're happy to sort of really spend some time figuring out where in the market to, to look at today, then, then yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Nico? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think we saw that the consumer AR stuff is really early. We clearly need some hardware, and we hope that our friends at Apple and others are really working on it uh, so that they can help create this market. If you're a founder who really cares about working on very hot stuff, uh, can uh, get to improve her, his dating life or other aspects of their life because they're working on the super hype stuff. AR is not that market today. Yeah. But if you're the cockroach type founder that Paul Graham and others have written about, then you want to find your way and navigate into uh, some early signal of uh, especially enterprise budgets, it's encouraging. The good news is there is not a lot of competition. <laughs> this is a sure. really good news. But you want to have the stamina and the endurance to really get there on the other side. It's going to take time. Do you think, by and large, the founders that are you know, probably going to succeed are at least having a pretty firm eye on enterprise applications right now? Is being a fully consumer play is probably a little bit risky right now? Uh, absolutely, yeah. On the consumer front, it's really early. It's more of a feature today. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some things going on in gaming, but you want to license the IP, and we've seen the technical challenges are severe. Um, but on the enterprise, yeah, absolutely. This is where the opportunities are. And mm -hmm. we're eager to find more companies in uh, that front. No consumer p pivots in 60s uh, immediate future. Not in our immediate future. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What uh, you know in the the panel descriptions talking about 12 to 18 months, and I know in in the AR world it's kind of either you're operating on these year long time frames or you're just you know thinking like well in 2030 after we make 14 trillion dollars as an industry, <laughs> like you know when when you think of these these last last 12 months since the the past AWE have any new opportunities emerged or any new kind of industry slices that you know AR customers have kind of popped yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been it's been. Um um, remarkable, like definitely AR Core and AR Kit um, got everyone excited and sort of went, okay, it's time to start looking at this stuff. And a year ago, you know, we talked to customers and they're all interested and excited, but they didn't actually know what they wanted. They didn't know what would work for them and they hadn't really tried anything. So they're just hoping someone would just show up and, you know, make it easy for them. But what's different now is we are talking with customers and, and generally this applies to like the bigger the, the customer, the more likely this is is that they have figured out some use cases or some features where you know computer vision and spatial awareness and this sort of stuff is really going to deliver some sort of value to their, their business and their customers. And they've probably tried to do it themselves. And they've tried to do it with ARKit or they've tried to do it with HoloLens and they've realized that, oh, here's some, some blocking issue, like the, either the technology on the phone isn't good enough or the headsets are still a bit clunky. And so when we have conversations with customers, what we're finding is, you know, the first question we ask is, you know, 
do you know what you want and have you tried to do it yourself? And if they say yes, then it's then they'll say to us, you know, well, can you do X, Y, Z? And we'll, you know, hopefully say yes. And if that's the case, then it's pretty much one phone call and we straight away kick off a, you know, like, great, let's start talking about a deal and a project. And that's that's real. Like, we're, we're signing, you know, six, seven-figure deals on the basis of these very short conversations because the last year has been spent, you know, over them trying to figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. I, just, just for the people in the audience, what does 60.ai actually do? And like, you know, when your customer thinks of a problem they have, how are, you know, yeah. what, what, what problems are those that they're coming to you with? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the easiest way to think of this is, is something like Amazon Web Services for, you know, spatial understanding. Um, we make a set of APIs that developers build their apps on top of, and those APIs help solve problems you know, using computer vision, using some sort of you know, 3D reconstruction or AR technologies to make apps possible that haven't been possible before. And so the types of things that um, companies are coming to, they're not looking for like virtual characters in the real world. They're looking for, give me a model of this space and help me extract some sort of information from this 3D space. Give me a way to help people you know, understand this you know, this city or this building or whatever it is, this campus that, that my company operates in, you know, help me find a way to, um, you know, avoid sending people out on site to inspect or check on things. And it's not really AR, it's really, you know, spatial understanding. And it's, it's the difference between what can I get from like a 2D photo or a, or a checklist versus having like a, a almost real time 3D model of that space. And mm -hmm. that's they're the sort of use cases that we're... Okay. Um. So talking about, you know, we've talked about a little few of the opportunities here. You know, if we also look back on the past year, there have been some pretty, like, visceral failures. And when you think, you know, I don't know, startups like, like Blipar and what happened to them come to mind a little bit. Like, when you think about what's happened to some of these teams, what are they not really grasping about either who their customer is or what, you know, what their company should be focusing on? Like, what are, what are just some of these general AR teams doing wrong right now? Yeah, so I would say it's, um, most of them think that the market is happening in front of them right now. Uh -huh. So they go and raise some capital because some people are better storytellers than others. And they start aggressively spending that capital on building a whole team, trying to go multi-platform from day one, and frankly, you know, overestimating how much uh, revenue they can have from early customers. Yeah. And only a year later or a year and a half later, when they uh, are running low on capital, and they have to go to investors once again, they realize, oh shit, you know, revenue is not coming in. Mm -hmm. It's maybe, you know, some pilot budgets or building hardware is much uh, harder than what we thought before. And uh, by the way, you know, the market on the investor side is softening a little bit because the hype is not as strong as it was a year, two, three years ago. Sure. Um, so that, that's what's been going on. The best news though is that uh, early employees and team members of these companies who basically got some expensive education for free <laughs> on the dime of other investors are the ones who are now realizing, huh, there are some interesting opportunities along the lines of what Matt was talking about before. We have the intimate knowledge, we understand which um, pieces of software work, we understand where some promises we want to um, frankly, you know, um, work over this for the next five, six years to mm -hmm. find out if there is some signal or not. As Matt mentioned, all the bigger companies, uh, even if you go in the app store and you can see which are the ones who integrated uh, ARKit and ARCore and their product, they've tried uh, and doubled a little bit in AR. And some of them that have specialized teams, like you can go on LinkedIn and literally, you know, see which of the Fortune 5000 have AR people. Uh, so, so the ones, you know, that have tried they understand now what the problems are. Okay. Uh, so you can contact them. They're pretty much eager to talk to startups. Like I often, you know, go and talk to them as a means, you know, to get better feedback about opportunities we should be spending time on. So they're good people, you know, to go and talk to mm -hmm. for helping evaluate um, your idea. But it, it's still, you know, like early days, the key is to have the patience. That's the key. Early days, I feel like I've heard that one uh, a couple of <laughs> times. Yeah, I, I, I guess, um, did you think, you know, there, there are some AR startups that have raised a ton of money. And when you, when you think about these people, do you think that, like, investors have just, you know, seen what Apple is foretelling and have maybe gotten a little uh, starry-eyed in the beginning about what they're able to do with allocating this capital, like, right now? Uh, do you th yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in some of these meetings, and you know, once in a while you get to meet a founder who can uh, paint a very detailed picture of the future, and you're like, oh my God, if just a small piece of what I just heard comes through, the greed and fear emotions kick in, and mm -hmm. then you know that your friends from other firms are really eager to look into this opportunity, like, oh shit, you know, if I don't do it, and they do it, and they become filthy rich, and I don't, what the heck is going on? Uh -huh. um, so some of those founders are very inspiring, and, and some of them actually you know, are leaving the apples and their likes, and they come in, and they give you a pitch, oh great, you know, you're wearing the Apple Watch, we designed that, and we're raising 10 million bucks to build the next computing platform, um, so that's compelling. Mm -hmm. Question, you know, on our side is, okay, because you did something amazing at Apple, can you now think like a cash-strapped founder uh, yeah. to build something the startup way? TBD. Yeah. Uh, but the hardest, uh, the hardest thing, you know, for all those founders is to unlearn a lot of the things that they learned in their previous lives mm -hmm. um, and do things in a startup, uh, long-term patient, you know, uh, way. You saw what happened with Meta. That's a company that was overhyped for a very long period of time. Sure. Like I felt really bad, you know, that I didn't take it seriously in the uh, early days. Mm -hmm. But clearly, the market, you know, wasn't uh, there uh, for them. Yeah. Are th are there any questions when you're kind of in the diligence process that you feel like can kind of get to the heart of this, or you know, how how can you you know see if the founder is actually totally. The, the biggest yeah. one is like, do they have a customer in mind that yeah. they can solve a problem for from day one. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you would like them themselves to be their own customer, like them working at one of these bigger companies. They uh, hack together a solution that looked like AR type, yeah. and now that they figured the technology is mature enough, they can actually productize it and build it for other companies as well. So if they have a customer in mind, and two, are they savvy enough to do a uh, quite a bit of market research and talk to some of the AR execs in the bigger companies that I mentioned before? Um, that's all you know. We're looking for. It's very simple. From there on, it's like all about like the ambition levels. Like, mm -hmm. are you somebody like Matt? You know, who's been trying for a decade. This is your third company in the space, but you're still eager to shoot for the moon, as well as ability to learn really quickly. In mm -hmm. particular, if you're a first timer. Yeah, looking, looking at the customer, I think that's one of the most interesting things about Leap Motion's exit today uh, to, to Ultra Haptics, uh, reportedly, uh, was that, you know, for the longest time, a lot of people had just, you know, they're like, these are the coolest demos I've ever seen. It's really interesting, but it always did feel like kind of a problem in search of a solution. Absolutely. So yeah. we saw Leap Motion seed round. Uh, it was back in early 2011. And uh, the two founders came into our office and they gave us one of the most impressive demos the firm had ever seen till that point. Mm -hmm. But then when we asked them, hey, you know, that's fantastic. Who is going to be the user? Who is going to be paying you dollars? Everyone. Um, it was everyone. It's like, you know, a lot of hand waving. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, we saw that a couple of rounds afterwards, um, same answer. So, like, that's something that you need to have. A, a an answer to who is the customer that we have in mind, especially as the company progresses. In the beginning of the seed stage, especially in the crazy market times we're living through right now, you can fake it. Mm -hmm. But over time, you can't. You, know, you owe it to yourself first and foremost. Is the key to finding that customer just chatting with other people, or is there anything, you know, I mean, I guess you can't really fake it into finding a mission for your company. I mean, so some people are like true visionaries, and they're the ones you know, who ha can help create markets. The reality is the vast majority of us are not. Yeah. Uh, so, probably it's safe to assume that you're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> as a result, uh, do a lot of like you know customer discovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, one specific to like AR and all this type of stuff that I've had to learn is that there's a you know you need to figure out the the use case and the technology and the market. You know, yeah. a lot of a lot of um, ideas that you know, I've seen and thought of over the years, generally you have two of those, you know, it's some technology and a use case, but there's not a big enough market, or there's this amazing world-changing market idea, and you can imagine how everyone's going to use it, but the technology is not possible. So I think until you really understand that all three of those are viable, you're not going to be able to find a customer. Yeah. It kind of, it, it seems like some, some, something that's central to entering an industry where it's all kind of like a little amorphous is that you just have to be ready to do some soft pivots. So like, right. how, how have you felt like even, you know, in, in the past couple of years of your company, just kind of 
approaching a customer and then kind of seeing that this customer is using it in a certain way and kind of diverting yeah, path a little I mean, bit? Some, some of the things, I mean, some of the, uh, and I've pivots is the right word, but like Nico said, this is like my third attempt solving the same problem. So I've definitely yeah. learned, you know, from my first company, you know, 10 years ago, nine years ago, not to try and build like the whole stack. Like don't build an application and the technology. <laughs> they're they're yeah. two very separate companies and skill sets. Um, but even in the, the sort of last year or so, you know, we, we definitely, we have an ambition to serve like every developer eventually, but for, there's a large segment of the, you know, people that want to do something in AR that the whole pipeline of their workflow isn't there and will only ever be like one slice of that workflow. So they're still waiting on, you know, maybe Unity or Unreal or someone to deliver some tools or some sort of content hosting aspect that you know, we're not doing. Mm -hmm. And so we've just had to you know, focus in, more than pivot, but more like just, just reduce and reduce and reduce that focus to find those customers who are, um, you know, understand what they need and, and can sort of use us. You know, we've been very fortunate that, that we've had so much inbound that we haven't really had to go out looking for that. We've just kind of had to filter through what's coming in, but it has been like a very clear filtering and probably only one in 10 you know, interesting companies that reaches out, actually we, we start working with right now and the rest are like, they'll come back in six months. Mm -hmm. I think, I think m maybe this is a good uh, transition, like early on it kind of felt like when you were talking to an AR startup, you're like, well, Google, Facebook, Apple, they're all knocking on your door, what makes you think that they're not gonna come up with a solution? It kind of, you know, it feels like you've come up with a little bit of a different answer to that. It also helps that you're an enterprise, not solely focused on consumer, but like why, why don't you feel too worried about kind of the looming specter of some of these tech uh, titans? I mean, always worrying. Yeah, <laughs> okay. No, it's not that I'm not worried. Um, <laughs> it, it's, and, and even even that, like like we're focusing on enterprise customers right now because that's where the market is. That's that's not, like our ambition is, is much, much bigger than that. But um, there's, uh, sort of right now, the, the opportunities that are, you know, big for us, like, you know, like a, a seven-figure deal is, is awesome for a company our size. But those bigger platforms, like, th that's not a big enough market for them to be interested in. So while we're, you know, probably we could be ten times as big before we become a, a problem to mm -hmm. someone like that. So um, that's, that's sort of one aspect. And the other is that we've, we've definitely got a technical capability that, you know, most other companies don't have, which is giving us attention. But the position we've got in the market um, seems to be something that the business models of the big companies can't really do in that we are able to be both you know, cross-platform and we, you know, we don't sell advertising. So we manage your data, or like our customers' data, in a way that is you know, private and secure and in, in line with their business needs, not mm -hmm. advertisers' business needs. So right now, if, if a big company wants to build a, like a, a serious AR app, they have to decide well, do we just focus on HoloLens or just on iOS, or do we go cross-platform and, and hope that Snap or Facebook, you know, takes care of our data? And um, we're able to, to sort of be there and say, look, we can do both. And, and by the way, our technology is as good as anything they've got, and that, that makes it a pretty easy conversation. Gotcha. Uh, well, you mentioned Snap, and I'd be remiss to ask, uh, since Nico's on stage, you know, what, also talking about consumer AR, you know, what, what do you think of kind of Snap's current efforts and, like, how hard is it to compete directly with you know these big big giants when you're kind of a, a second second step? It, it's really hard. I yeah. would say almost impossible. Mm -hmm. The only way to do it is to out innovate them on product, and then you hope you know that they will copy you, but hopefully at a uh, slower late, uh, mm -hmm. slower rate. Maybe you know copy your privacy co policy along the way too could help. <laughs> but. Um, you know, Snap is a company that continues to uh, be very, uh, very cool, innovating on the product front, and now they're trying to create their own ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, anything that's going on over there on the gaming front, I personally, you know, uh, find it uh, very exciting because for the users of Snap, it's basically their own version of the private internet. And, and Snap and the founder has always been really smart being able to think like the 16-year-old girl that is the core <laughs> user of the platform. Like he has that unique ability, uh -huh. had it from day one. Um, and not only, you know, she can communicate with her closest friends, not only she can um, consume the content that normally that kind of person is very excited about, but now she can start 
playing games and do all the other things that normally you would go on other products on the internet to do. Why not do them on Snap? It's early days, TBD. I love seeing companies that are leveraging Snap's distribution. That's what I love. And if you go to the App Store now, you can see products like YOLO and others that mm -hmm. have shot up on the top of the charts. That's exciting. It feels yeah. like the good old days of Facebook opening up its platform mm -hmm. with you know all the good and bad stuff that came afterwards. But if you're a small startup looking for distribution, Snap is now offering you a helping hand. So what you said earlier about kind of talking about, you know, I guess I kind of led you into it, but what we're talking about AR Enterprise being like an area that you should be looking, do you think that kind of applies to Snap or do they have a pretty carved out niche and they've already kind of established the stack in the consumer space? I mean, it's, it's early days, you know, because if you ask most users, do they think they're using an AR product, they would say, what is that, right? I don't even know. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Snap has really captured a lot of mindshare as the camera company, and now they're pushing the envelope forward with offering some of uh, their software to outsiders to uh, use it and leverage it. Leverage it. Also, you know, they're offering their distribution to outsiders to leverage it, but they want you know a bunch of the critical content to continue to uh, be consumed on the platform. Mm -hmm. They want the graph to stay on Snap, which as you are a developer, you have to think you know, really hard about it. Do you want uh, your graph to always be on somebody else's platform? I mean, when Evan was getting started, everybody was using Facebook uh, login to get going, Facebook mm -hmm. Connect. He was the only one who said, screw that, I don't want to do that. Yeah. So if you're the consumer facing uh, company, sure, Distribution can be helpful, sure. Leveraging somebody else's tech is great, but it comes with a price. Mm -hmm. um, you know, consumer AR is very early. I, I do believe that in absence of having really cool hardware, we're not going to see something that can be a standalone product that all of us love and will eat up all of our time sure. as well as we poured our graph in it. Cool. So, so kind of wrapping things up, uh, you know, as we look to AWE 11. What are kind of the uh, what, are, what are kind of the industries that you see kind of interest vaguely bubbling up? Maybe they haven't. Maybe they've signed some you know pilot programs. What 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 industries do you think that people should kind of be uh, focusing their their attention towards, especially in enterprise? I know auto was yeah. kind of the big story this yeah, past in, year. Yeah, in terms of specific verticals. Um, yeah, I mean what we're, we're expecting to see, like in terms of the customers we're talking to, is products going live, like internally for those things, they're going to be, uh, you know, companies that are in, you know, real estate, construction, factories, campuses, theme parks, you know, anywhere where there's a big space involved in doing the job. And um, we'll be, yeah, well and truly out of, out of pilots. And these will be like production, clear ROI working. And we'll probably see some consumer, you know, consumer products that may not have scale, but their their concept is is viable. You know, they, they may not have taken off, but that's yeah. that's kind of where I think we'll be in a, in a year. Any any verticals you're keeping an eye on for? So I have AR the benefit of working with Mod, and <laughs> I think of Mod and 6D as the index company for AR, because basically, you know, you've decided to work with one or two companies per every vertical: real estate, hospitality, manufacturing, and it goes on. Uh, so for me, I'm really passionate about retail and what's going on over there because when I talk to the likes of Shopify, Walmart, Macy's, basically that whole theme of like what can we do to compete with Amazon mm -hmm. uh, has gotten them be really eager to try new technologies yeah. and uh, all of them now have AR teams. Uh, so I'm excited to see what can come out of that. Awesome. All right. Hey, well, thanks so much for, uh, for chatting. Appreciate it. Yeah.